Thank you, Rob, and thanks to all for joining us today for iNACL's webinar on E-Rate. This is the second in a series on E-Rate 2.0. Today's webinar will cover defining drivers and capacity needs, and we have uh, three terrific speakers here today that I'd like to introduce. Um, I'll be doing the opening and joined by Jennifer Davis, the Program Director for the Council of Chief State School Officers Innovation Lab Network, talking more about the drivers for E-Rate. Um, Evan Marwell, the CEO and co-founder for Education Superhighway, and Susan Benzendi, the Associate Director for Assessment and Technology for Achieve and Park, will be talking more about the capacity needs and, and drivers from a national perspective. And um, I want to thank all of you participants for joining us. There is a chat uh, area in the lower left corner and a talk button in the upper right hand corner for uh, speakers to toggle on and off. INACL is a nonprofit organization focused on policy, quality, and new learning models. We are uh, focused on ensuring that all students have access to a world-class education and quality blended in online learning opportunities that prepare them for a lifetime of success. And we're asking the question, how do we help drive the future of education towards new student-centered, transformational models that are mastery-based um, and blended learning in nature? So the INACOL uh, webinar series in partnership with CCSO, and let me just use the microphone on here, Rob, if you can turn that off. Thank you. INACOL CCSSO series of E-rate webinars. The first one was held on July 25th, and it was basics around the history of E-rate um, right after the notice from the FCC of the proposed rulemaking. Um, as background, today we're focusing on defining the drivers and capacity needs for improving E-Rate 2.0 and save the date for August 20th for the Connect Ed initiative and E-Rate for Q&A with the FCC and Department of Education officials. These are archived and recorded and you may access them. So what are some of the key drivers? From INACL's perspective, we're looking at new solutions using online and blended learning. 40% of U.S. high schools do not offer AP courses. A number of programs provide online AP, and 75% of our school districts are using online learning to offer AP classes or college-level courses. 40% of public school districts, often in rural and low-income areas, say they need online learning resources to provide certified teachers. More than 50% of school districts need online learning to help reduce scheduling conflicts and provide that flexibility for students to graduate on time. 60% of school districts in the U.S. say they need online learning for credit recovery. So there are driving the capacity needs for internet and broadband access in our schools. These trends towards online learning, towards blended learning in the classroom, combining the best of the online digital content resources and tools to personalize instruction, competency-based approaches that allow for anytime, anywhere learning, online credit recovery to help students catch up, as well as mobile learning inside of schools, out in the community, um, anytime, anywhere. So nationally, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer Davis, uh, who is leading the work at the CCSSO Innovation Lab Network. Um, it has more than 10 states uh, and other states within CCSSO really examining next generation learning, as well as the work that we're doing collaboratively on uh, the Gates Foundation Next Generation Learning Challenges, where Wave 3 and now Wave 4 new grants have gone out to help launch um, and plan personalized blended mastery-based new school models. This is also driving the need for increased internet in the classroom. So these models require robust technology platforms, um, new skills and professional development for people, new models of assessment that include online assessment, 
computer-based assessment, and adaptive embedded formative assessment models as well for personalization and online and digital content. These new models are key drivers. And one of our top policy issues at INACL is to ensure full access to the broadband infrastructure. We have a lot of work to do. Um, we're really pleased that the administration and the FCC has launched an uh, examination to update E-rate. Um, this announcement was made on, in an open meeting on July 19th, and the notice of proposed rulemaking and comments on over, I believe, 600 questions, those comments are due on September 16th, so the education community has a very short timeline to engage and dig in on this issue and provide comments to help shape the future of E-rate. So with that, I'm going to pause on my questions and turn it over to Jennifer Davis so she can cover the national overview from CCSSO's perspective on drivers through the lens of her work at the Innovation Lab Network. Jennifer? All right, thank you so much, Susan. Um, hopefully you guys can hear me OK. Um, so it, it's my pleasure to just comment a little bit about uh, what we're seeing as far as drivers for the need for uh, E-rate uh, from a national perspective and then turn it over to the rest of the folks on this webinar who can dig in a little bit deeper. Um, and so this all really begins, this conversation begins with the new North Star that uh, our states have defined for themselves, which is college and career readiness for all students. Um, and so states are finding that in order to do this, um, they need higher standards, they need better measures, and they need different ways of organizing the classroom and the learning experience so that all students can actually reach uh, this new goal for the system. And so this is driving education transformation across the nation. So um, a number of states uh, as well as a number of districts and schools, as Susan mentioned, are pursuing personalized mastery-based learning uh, where they're really integrating technology to use anytime, anywhere opportunities for learning. Um, we're seeing a lot with computer adaptive assessment that adjusts in real time as students input, uh, and then real time data collection and reporting. And so all of these naturally uh, lead us to new requirements for technology, including software and hardware, but also new requirements for connectivity. Um, and so some of the examples that I know folks will be digging into a little bit more on this webinar is, of course, the uh, assessments, of the 2014 assessments um, that are coming will, of course, require greater connectivity in the classroom, but also require greater uh, just technology capacity. But um, connectivity, especially to the extent that these assessments will be adaptive or that um, reporting is done online. Uh, and then, as Susan alluded, other examples that we're seeing nationally just have to do with innovation and the changes that are occurring in the classroom. So I um, wanted to speak briefly about how some of these are, uh, changes are occurring at a state level. I know Susan alluded to the next generation learning challenges where um, individual schools or districts are taking on this change and really rethinking how they're using, uh, how they're leveraging technology to change the interaction between students and teachers in the classroom and their interaction with the content. Um, CCSSO is also leading uh, the Innovation Lab Network, which is a collection of nine states who are taking action together to figure out what do these kinds of changes in the learning environment mean at a state level. The states are actually taking on this agenda and gearing their systems towards world-class knowledge and skills, performance-based learning, personalized learning, comprehensive systems of supports for students, anytime, everywhere, technology-enabled opportunities that really drive towards student agency. Um, so these are the pillars of the Innovation Lab Network, this group of nine states who work together. And um, just to briefly comment on the network, and then I'll share with you all just some of what this looks like on the ground. So the uh, schools and districts and island states are coming together to advance these innovative practices, the blended learning, the competency-based learning where students are actually progressing through curriculum based on their needs at that moment, getting real-time feedback uh, where the lessons are personalized towards each student. 
um, uh, schools and districts are coming together to actually implement this. And um, what our states are doing is coming together to share lessons learned and actually translate that into policy action. What does that mean for their graduation requirements, for their assessment systems? If they're really going to have balanced and comprehensive systems of assessment, what are the implications for the infrastructure that they need, uh, both hardware, software, and as well as connectivity? Uh, what does that mean for their accountability systems? What does that mean for uh, educator uh, training, evaluation, and all of these questions? And so CCS is so, uh, is actively facilitating this collaboration among these states, uh, and then also with a, a broader audience. So just a, a little bit briefly, and I won't dwell on these too long, but we've, um, I'd like to share with you just some stories that we've collected from Innovation Lab Network sites describing what exactly it is that they're doing that looks so different in the classroom. And um, I, I wanted to share these because I think it really grounds the conversation in the why of why we're even talking about connectivity and, and what exactly can be done in these classrooms if you can have the, uh, the technology and the connectivity. So here's a classroom in one of our ILM sites um, that's using Alex as a tool that's a tool that has um, adaptive assessments and, and uh, real-time feedback. Uh, so that students can move at a pace, can measure it with their ability to learn the content and the skills. And it, uh, this teacher is telling us that teachers monitor frequently. They incorporate many or small group lessons strategically based on student progress. None of that is possible without uh, greater connectivity. And then um, <clears throat> she's also describing their literacy center, which uses Google Apps, and online teacher developed rubrics for ongoing feedback. They're, they're working with their teachers and improving teacher practice through the use of uh, greater connectivity as well. Here's another excerpt from another site um, talking about how she's just really uh, compiling and cobbling all sorts of different online features together, so audio, boo, blogger, Google sites, and so students are using all of these together with their um, different smartphones and iPads, uh, and it's enabling the teacher to provide direct and immediate attention to the student uh, in their progress with their reading. Uh, and so the, the teacher can do that. Other students can also provide feedback. And so learning is no longer contained to a specific point in time in the classroom, but can really happen anytime and anywhere. Um, my last example for you shows how Technology and connectivity can really promote uh, student agency. So this teacher is describing the one-to-one uh, -one iPad rollout in their classroom and how a first grade student, a first grade student, pulls out her iPad, snaps a photo of some data that they're discussing, and then takes her group to another location in the room where they pull up the data, they use a sketch application, mark up the data, collaborate over it, and work to solve the problem. And the teacher says this without any teacher direction. This student demonstrated her understanding of how technology can facilitate learning and allowed them opportunities to move anywhere and mark and remix the data to make it their own. So um, tremendous potential for technology and connectivity to enable students um, to really develop agency in this in a first, first grade classroom. Uh, so just some examples of state-level movement that we're seeing. Um, California piloting their education technology task force recommendations, which include a, a number of things along the lines of uh, blended learning and integrating technology to change teacher practice. Uh, Iowa creating a statewide plan for digital learning. Kentucky developing uh, open educational resources linked to the Common Core for broad distribution. Uh, Maine exploring expanded access to online courses, simulations, and video resources for their students. New Hampshire exploring open source data systems and other digital platforms to support their competency-based education system, and also using an online platform for uh, teacher networking, uh, professional learning communities, and professional development. And then Wisconsin is implementing statewide, uh, statewide learning management system for their students, and also a place where teachers can post uh, and download resources to use in their classroom. Um, one last thing I want to mention before I turn it back to the rest of the presenters is that CCS is so is uh, 
leading a digital learning task force, so recently launched with our chief uh, in order to engage federal policymakers uh, in support of improved digital learning opportunities for all students. And so the task force is uh, co-chaired by two of our chiefs, Tom Luna from Idaho and Tom Perlickson from California. Um, and its objective, its first objective for this task force is to inform the SEC rulemaking that Susan mentioned um, and the expansion of the E-rate program. And so specifically, the task force is charged with advising upon appropriate targets for E-rate success, what metrics could define that success, and then what would be the state's role in E-rate program administration. Um, and so, again, just going back to that new North Star of preparing all students for college and career readiness, that, that all word is part of, I think, the tremendous importance of this conversation around connectivity. We have to eliminate the digital divide in public schools so that all students can actually have access to 21st century learning opportunities that lead to 21st century knowledge, skills, and dispositions in college and career readiness and success. That's it for me. I'll turn it back to Susan and the rest of the panel. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jennifer. And we can pause just a moment. If anybody has any questions for Jennifer or for me, this might be a good time just to stop for a moment. Feel free to type those questions in the chat room. And I'll just see if anybody in the audience has questions right now before we move ahead. Seeing none, let's go ahead and continue the conversation on drivers and capacity needs. Evan Marwell, who is the CEO of Education Superhighway, has uh, running an incredible initiative. And Evan, I'm so thrilled that you can join us today. I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thanks very much, everybody, for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, when I was asked to participate in this, uh, they asked if I would bring data. So you're going to see a lot of data in the next uh, eight or ten slides, and hopefully that will shed a little light on, uh, on where we stand today. Um, just as background for everybody who's on the call, um, Education Superhighway is a nonprofit. Our mission is to upgrade the Internet infrastructure of every K-12 public school in America for digital learning. And we're doing this by, uh, through four programs that we've aligned with what we see as the primary roadblocks to actually upgrading our schools. Um, the first is our National School Speed Test Program, uh, which uh, is helping schools understand w whether or not they need to be upgraded and helping states and policymakers um, understand sort of where their schools are. So it's an awareness builder as well as a specific school identifier for who needs to be upgraded. Um, our second program is our Network Snapshot, where we actually work in, our technical folks work in conjunction with school districts to help them create the upgrade plans for the schools that need to be upgraded, um, and focusing particularly on the seven or eight bottlenecks that can exist in a, in a K-12 uh, Internet network. Um, our third program is to lower the cost of connectivity and equipment, and we are working on something we call our Internet Pricing Portal, which is essentially collecting purchasing information uh, from the E-rate program from districts around the country to actually provide transparency into what people are paying for both connectivity as well as for the equipment that folks use for Wi-Fi and, and their local area networks. And the reason this is an important uh, issue is that um, what we find is that there's a tremendous amount of variability in what schools pay for both connectivity and equipment. And some of that is due, frankly, just to the fact that people don't know what they should be paying. And then the, the last piece, which is I think why we're here today, is um, we've been doing a lot of work over the last year uh, and, and a bit with the FCC to support the E-rate modernization process to get it going and, uh, and are very involved in sort of uh, supporting that work going forward. So that's a little bit background on us. Um, I think to put, put in context uh, what we're trying to accomplish here, I like to put up this slide. If you look at how technology has come into schools uh, over, the, over the last couple of decades, um, 
technology started in the principal's office. It was used for administrative tasks and for financials and things like that. Um, it then moved to the teacher's desk for, again, grading and attendance and, and other administrative tasks primarily, and starting to bleed a little bit into learning. Um, so what you're looking at is really just 5 million users uh, historically that, that our networks have had to support. And also, equally importantly, our networks could really be what we call best effort networks. In other words, if the network went down, it was an inconvenience, but it wasn't mission critical because learning didn't stop. So what we're trying to do now as we talk about assessment, as we talk about blended learning, as we talk about really trying to personalize learning for, for all of our students, we're going to go from a network that's supporting 5 million users in a best efforts way to supporting 55 million users in a mission critical way. Because to, in, the, in the network of tomorrow, if, if the network goes down, learning will stop. And that will be unacceptable. And so this is really a transformative mo moment, if you will, for K-12 networks. It's not that we've all done such a bad job historically. It's just that the needs are really changing, and both in terms of the scale, a 10x increase in the number of users, and the, and the mission criticality of the network as well. So that's a little bit of context for what we're trying to achieve. So what do we need? Um, this is a slide that we like to use to talk about sort of how much bandwidth we think is, is needed in school today and, and what's going on in the future. Um, we believe that video is going to be an important part of uh, education in the future, and, and that's one of the ways blended learning will really be able to have an impact. The typical standard definition video today requires one and a half megabits for one student to watch a video. So if you then think about a classroom where 30 kids are all uh, doing their own video and, and having a personalized instructional period, that takes you from one and a half megabits to 45 megabits of bandwidth that you're going to need. If you then scale that up to what we call the digital learning school, where maybe at any given time, 20% of the kids in, in, in a school are doing something personalized, whether it's video or social learning or collaborative learning and, 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 or other high bandwidth applications, that then gets you to about 120 megabits. So we think that the first stop in this progress needs to be that schools need to have 100 megabits or more of bandwidth. Um, now, as I'm sure all of you have heard about with the Connect Ed program, the President has laid out and, the FC, and several of the FCC commissioners have also supported this, a goal of one gigabit per school. And we think that's a really realistic goal that we should be shooting for in the next five years. It's something that the State Education Technology Directors Association has talked about as well. Because as we go from 20% of the school day being spent in personalization to 50 or 60 or 80%, you're going to need that extra bandwidth. You're also going to need that because they're going to be newer and even more bandwidth intensive applications that come along that schools are wanting, going to want to take advantage of. The other thing that our data shows is that teachers, frankly, are waiting for robust internet infrastructure. Um, what this chart shows is along the, uh, the y-axis is how much bandwidth is available in, in a classroom or in a school. And on the x-axis is what percentage of the time is that bandwidth being utilized. And what you see is a very clear trend that's sort of up and to the right, as we like to say, which is as the network gets more reliable, as teachers can count on the fact that they're going to have plenty of bandwidth, they use it more. And we think this is very consistent with sort of uh, anecdotal information, which basically says a teacher who doesn't believe the network's going to work 100% of the time isn't willing to integrate technology into their lessons because they're, they're afraid of the consequences if the network goes down. So this is being borne out by, by the data that we've been collecting as part of our speed test. The other data that we've collected as part of our speed test is, is where does the nation stand uh, today, both in terms of being ready for assessment and also being ready for digital learning. Um, on the left side of the chart, you see what our data shows. And just to step back for a second, uh, this is data from about uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of the schools in the country. We've had over 400,000 test sessions, and we have over a million data points uh, contributing to this. So we, we believe this is pretty robust data. On the left side is the assessment uh, uh, situation. And here we've used the, uh, the Smarter Balanced standard. So Smarter Balanced says that for basic assessment, which think move the bubble charts to the computers, you need a minimum of 20 kilobits per student. And roughly uh, 
50, uh, 58% of our, our schools uh, have that much bandwidth. But to do the kind of media-rich as assessment that folks want to do as part of the Common Core Next Gen ass Assessments, you need 50 kilobits per student, and only 27% of our schools have enough bandwidth to actually implement that. Um, if you flip over to the di digital learning readiness and you look at the, st the CETA standards, CETA basically says you need 100 kilobits per student to do effective digital learning today. Only 23% of our schools have that today. And in 2017, just four years from now, they say you're going to need a megabit per student, and actually less than 1% of our schools are ready for that there, uh, that today. So, so we really do have a, a, a big gap that we need to fill, um, and I think that's why the E-rate uh, modernization is, is so important to, to sort of helping us achieve this goal. Now, when we talk about networks, one of the important things that, to think about is historically people think about bandwidth and they think about just the connectivity piece, so the stuff that's sort of going up to the middle school in the chart. Um, really, that's only half the equation. The other half, as most of you know, is, is actually getting it from the door of the school to the device, to the classroom. And that really is the, the local area network and the Wi-Fi. And this just sort of shows that both of these things are critical. And in the work we've done with our, our national school speed test as well as our network snapshot, what we find out there is that there are significant issues in both of these areas. And often we'll find districts that actually have pretty good bandwidth coming to the door of the school, but they haven't been able to get the kind of priority two money they need from the E-rate program, and as a result, haven't been able to make the investments in their local area network and their Wi-Fi, and so their bandwidth gets dragged down by that. So when we start to talk about E-rate, one of the things we need to understand is where's the money all going? There's a, a very constant refrain out there that there isn't enough money. And um, so one of the things we've been spending time on and some of the data that we've looked at is where actually is the money being spent? And we've tried to take it down below the levels that USAC reports at um, and into sort of what's the money actually being used for. And, and from our preliminary analysis, and we'll be doing more of this as, uh, as the next few months go by, what we're seeing is that roughly 58% of the dollars being spent are being spent on the data network, i.e., the stuff that we need to provide the bandwidth to the classroom, to the device, in order to make um, uh, in digital learning a, a reality. Fully a third of the money is being spent on traditional telephony, whether that's you know, plain old phone lines or Centrix service or other things that people are using to support schools' phone services, with another 9% split between cell phones um, and application services, which are things like supporting email and web hosting and things like that. So the data network today is 58% of the spending. That's the good news. The bad news is that there is 42% of the spending that's not being spent on broadband. And, and we think this is one of the uh, most important things that we need to address as part of the E-rate modernization process. The other thing, though, is if you look inside that data network, you learn something very important. And if you think back to that, uh, that slide, that network diagram, uh, there really are uh, two components to getting bandwidth to the door of the school. The first is the Internet access. So that's the connectivity from the district office out to the Internet, tr traditionally through an, through an ISP. Um, but then there's what they call the wide area network, or the WAN, which is what takes that Internet access from the district office out to each of the schools in the district. And that is where the bulk of the money is being spent. Nearly 80% of the dollars from E-rate that are being spent on data network are going to the WAN. And the reason that this is important is because what this tells us is that if you really want to drive, uh, get the most out of your dollars from the E-rate program, what you really have to focus on first and foremost is the cost of that WAN infrastructure. Um, and there's one very, uh, and there's an important thing that we're going to talk about in terms of a lever that we think exists that, that hasn't been talked about a lot. But before I get to that, I want to show you sort of one last slide about sort of the situation where we are today. So on the left-hand side, what you see is, is the bandwidth that is currently being used, we estimate, across the nation in all the schools. So currently, we think there's about 2.5 terabits of data, which is a terabit is 1,000 gigabits, OK? 2.5 um, terabits nationwide of bandwidth that's available in our schools. 
According to the CETA standards, if we really want to be able to do digital learning today, we actually need five and a half terabits. Uh, again, that's 100 kilobits per student uh, across all of our schools. And by 2017, we're going to need 55 terabits, so a 10x increase in the amount of bandwidth. So now let's look at what that means for spending. Well, today, we think roughly 1.2 billion or so is being spent on uh, the bandwidth get, getting to our school doors. Um, if we sort of look at what we would need uh, to meet the 2013 standard of 5.5 terabits, that would mean $2.65 billion would need to be spent of E-rate subsidy on that. And the really important point about that, as I'm sure you all know, is that E-rate is only a $2.35 billion program. So even if we spent every dollar in the E-rate program, just on getting connectivity to the schools, no money for P2, no money for telephony, no money for any of the other stuff that E-rate supports today, we wouldn't have enough money. But when we look forward, and this is where it starts to get scary, even if we drop the cost of bandwidth by two-thirds between now and 2017, E-rate will be oversubscribed by almost 5x. It will take over $9 billion a year of funding to meet that 55 terabit need that CETA has talked about and that we also support and that the Connect Ed program supports as well. So if there's anything I'm sure of, I'm sure that the E-rate program will not be a $9 billion program in 2017, so we've got to find another way to deal with this. Or we're going to be faced with the choice of, uh, well, we're faced with the situation where schools, even in 2017, won't be able to get the bandwidth that they need. So as we've thought about this, uh, clearly one option would be to expand the program. We certainly support more funding for the program. Um, we don't think there's any chance that we're going to have $9 billion of funding for the program, so you've got to find alternate solutions. And that's what I'd like to sort of leave you with before I get to some specifics about the E-rate program, which is that there is a, a solution that's being used by school districts today, by large school districts, by small school districts, by medium-sized school districts, by rural school districts, by urban school districts, um, to actually change the game. And that is dark fiber. Um, so most of you probably know what fiber is, right? It's, it's, it's using uh, glass effectively, a glass wire, and shooting light over it as a way of creating uh, a data network. It's the highest capacity uh, bandwidth that you can deliver to a school. And frankly, the bandwidth you can deliver over fiber is virtually unlimited. Um, what makes it unlimited is that you simply, just like our computers get faster and faster, just like our cell phones get faster and faster, um, you just put new equipment on either end of that piece of glass that is the fiber, and it gives you more and more capacity. So what, we, what dark fiber is, is the ability for school districts to own or lease that piece of glass and then put their own electronics on either end of it. And the reason this is so important is that look at what it does to the cost per megabit. So today under the E-rate program, the median school is spending about $40 per megabit for bandwidth per month. Okay? Um, best practices if you go out to a phone company and lease bandwidth is around six, is 5 to $10, call it $6.15. Advanced school districts, school districts that have sort of thought about this problem and have gone out and said, you know what, I'm not going to go buy leased, um, fully lit lease services. I'm just going to get that piece of dark fiber and put my own equipment on either end. Their cost is down at 70 cents. And districts that had the capital and were able to invest in their own fiber and pay a construction company to actually run fiber between their schools are down as low as 8. And in fact, we've seen it as low as 6 cents already. So there's a huge order of magnitude decrease in cost that we can get by investing in dark fiber. And you'll see on the right side what that does to the bandwidth we can make available to schools. So today, median schools around 20 megabits. We can get under the current program and current spending, if we just move everyone to best practices, up to about 150, 160 megabits. That's pretty good for right now. But if we want to get to those gigabit or 10 gigabit numbers that CED is talking about, the President's talking about, um, we need to move to dark fiber or we need carriers to dramatically lower the cost that they're charging schools. 
Okay, so that's all the data. What does it mean for E-rate modernization? We, we think there are five key priorities. The first is update the goals to focus on Internet infrastructure. And importantly, we think that means is that priority one needs to be Internet access, wide area network, local area network, and Wi-Fi. And everything else that E-rate is paying today should be moved to priority two, only gets funded if those things, if our goals have been met for what schools need for priority one. Second, and this is very consistent with what um, the Connect Ed initiative is trying to do, we believe it's absolutely critical as a nation for us to fund a one-time capital investment to connect our schools to dark fiber and deploy ubiquitous wireless networks in a school. We need the one-time upgrade. Once we get that one-time upgrade investment, it will dramatically lower the costs to E-rate going forward. Third, we need to create incentives for pooled purchasing and cost savings. In other words, instead of having districts buy as 14,000 independent districts, we need districts to come together, aggregate their, their demand, just like anybody else does, and take the advantage of the fact that E-rate is maybe the single largest purchaser of bandwidth and network equipment in the country, so that our schools get the prices that that, that status deserves. Fourth, we need to increase transparency and accountability in the program. And there's two things in particular we need to do. Number one, the data, there's something in, e, in the E-rate called Form 471, Item 21, which is where schools talk about exactly what it is they're buying and the prices they're paying. That information needs to be submitted on the web. It needs to be made available so every school in the country can see it so they know what they should be paying for stuff. Number two, we need this data we're collecting with the speed test, it needs to be collected on a regular basis so that we can make sure funding is going to schools that actually need more bandwidth as opposed to schools that actually have enough bandwidth. Um, and finally, and I think this is a, a, a very common uh, refrain out there, we need to simplify the application process. Um, it should be a heck of a lot easier for schools without having to use, to con use consultants to apply for and get E-rate dollars. And that's all I've got. Thanks, Evan. That was terrific. And we've got some great questions geared up. So I'm actually going to go in an order that ties back to your discussion on the dark fiber um, because I think that'll flow more easily. Okay. So um, there were some questions that related back to our first webinar on E-rate on the overall program funds, the demands. Um, for those current funds that you touched on too. So we sent a link out that will uh, help people uh, go back to that initial webinar too. This is really the advanced session building into it. So two questions related to dark fiber. How does your analysis take into account the care and maintenance of the dark fiber? And then Nathan followed up with that and asked, in addition to care and maintenance, what about the installation of the dark fiber. So back to you, Evan. Okay. So um, the numbers that we showed you, if I actually flip back to the slide, the 69 cents and the 8 cents, so those are effectively the maintenance costs for the dark fiber. So that includes if someone puts a backhoe through your fiber, going out and fixing it. It includes uh, periodically you know, having to upgrade certain things. Um, it does not necessarily, it does not include the upfront investment required to being amortized in those numbers. And so that gets to your second question, which is what about the cost of that? Well, in our view, that's, that's the conundrum. Where do schools actually get the upfront money to pay for this? And, and from our point of view, what the President's trying to do in the Connect Ed initiative and what we are going to certainly advocate for in the um, uh, the E-rate modernization is that the FCC needs to figure out how to make it possible for E-rate to fund those upfront uh, investments. Thanks, Evan. And there was another question that was really towards the beginning of your conversation that was uh, really around within the classroom, and that was from Penny. And she just asked, is there a tipping point when teachers are confident in the network? And I, I don't know if you can speak to that at all. So, um, you know, what it looks like to us is that somewhere between, once you get to somewhere between uh, 50 and 100 kilobits per student, which frankly is probably talking about getting up towards, you know, in a typical elementary school, you know, 50 megabits 
um, you know, once you start getting into the middle and high schools, getting up probably more towards that, you know, 100 megabit level. Um, once you're getting up towards there, generally speaking, you're going to see uh, teachers getting more confident. But that's just an amount of bandwidth. The other thing teachers need to be confident in is the Wi-Fi network. And, you know, what that means is they have to be confident that, number one, there's ubiquitous coverage everywhere that they're going to teach, which may be beyond their classroom. And number two, that the density, what they call density, which is the number of devices that can be connected to that Wi-Fi without getting kicked off and having issues, will be sufficient. And so we think it's really important. Uh, our recommendation to most people is if you're building out a Wi-Fi network today, you should put one access point in every classroom. And, and, and they've got to be the right kind of access points. Um, you can't go down to Best Buy and you know, buy the thing that you would buy for your house. Um, and if you do both of those things and you've got enough bandwidth, which is you know, probably today somewhere between 50 and 100 megabits coming into the, into, the, into the school, that you'll generally be in pretty good shape. Thanks, Evan. And I'll do one more quick question before going over to Susan Van Gundy. It's from Jeff Jennings. Regarding Wi-Fi, what are you recommending for speed networking? Yeah, so we think that um, the speed, uh, you want to be on a minimum of the 802.11n standard, which is um, the most recent sort of commercial grade standard. There's a new standard called 802.11ac, uh, which is coming out. Uh, it's out somewhat already, but it's not really a sort of production release, I don't think, yet. Um, we think n from a speed point of view today is, is certainly sufficient. What's more important is this topic of density, which means that the, the, you, have, you have enough access points in the school that they're put in the right places and that the access points effectively have enough antennas in them that they can handle as many devices as you want to have. So I don't think it's really super important to you know, be thinking about AC, which promises to do gigabit uh, bandwidth, because if you think about it, a classroom for all 30 kids probably isn't going to be using a gigabit of bandwidth. Like in, in their wildest dreams, they might use you know, 150 megabits, and, and 802.11n should be able to handle that. But density and placement are really, really important. And then that network, the wireless network, needs to be supported by a, lo a wired network, what we call the LAN, that is a gigabit LAN. Uh, because if you put enough of these Wi-Fi access points around and you only have a 100 megabit LAN, which is the old standard, um, then you're going to start running into problems at that level. Agreed. Thank you, Evan, so much for that data and appreciate it. Let's turn it over now to Susan Van Gundy from the Park Assessment Consortia who is leading uh, the technology uh, and Common Core Assessments discussion. Susan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And uh, a pleasure to be here and meeting with everyone today. Um, so similarly to how Evan started his discussion, um, when I was asked to participate here, I think it's a, obviously a very good um, companion set of issues with what Evan has been presenting um, to talk about the, the capacity needs surrounding the upcoming um, Common Core assessment. And so I'm going to move sort of quickly through some of these first slides given our timing. Um, but just as a, a quick overview, um, PARC is the Partnership for Assessment and Readiness for College and Careers. We are one of the two large uh, assessment consortia funded by the U.S. Department of Education and the Race to the Top Assessment Consortium. There are a number of other consortia as well that are focused on different student populations. Um, but most of the states that are participating in the Common Core assessments are, are members of, as you know, either one or the other or both, uh, Smarter Balance being the other assessment consortium. Um, both focused on those math and English language arts assessments with field testing in um, this upcoming spring and uh, the first full operational year of the assessments in the school year 2014-2015. So both consortia are clearly very focused right now on releasing um, tools that can assist 
schools and districts and states in getting ready, planning for uh, the assessments at multiple levels across the school environment. And so this is when I'm going to talk about a little bit about what those capacity needs are based on the assessment design and delivery plan, as well as then some of the tools that the assessment consortia are releasing to assist their members, states, in, in getting ready and thinking about these issues. So providing that context for the connectivity needs. Um, so one of the things that just very quickly um, impacts the the need for bandwidth for connectivity related to the assessments is that um, the both assessment consortia and all speak obviously to this specific park are um, not just that one time per year for a few weeks summative assessment, but have components that are available uh, throughout the school year, including diagnostic and um, uh, mid-year assessments, as well as new assessments that are using, really using the technology to get at some of the traditionally difficult to assess skills and some of the more difficult to assess um, areas of the common core, in addition to the more large-scale summative assessments. So there is need for this connectivity level year-round, not just during a few weeks in the spring. Um, as I talk about the, the role of the technology and the rationale for the technology rich uh, richness of the assessments as they're being built, you know, a lot of the discussion around the Common Core talks about those shifts in, um, in the content and in what are expected of students. Uh, so I'd like to talk about that parallel. What are the shifts that we're seeing in terms of the use of technology integrated into learning and assessment and, and how that's impacting us? So certainly the scale of this is, is a massive driver. Um, we've gone from individual state tests that were generally sort of low complexity, paper and pencil delivery, to these more technology-rich year-round assessment environments um, that have the multiple components and that are utilizing the technology to help with scoring and reporting in a way that allows us to, to understand what students know and can do in different ways. So the kinds of items that uh, are being developed, Evan already alluded to this a little bit, um, are, are the more media-rich uh, authentic kinds of learning and uh, assessment tasks that are using authentic passages instead of commissioned pieces that are using snippets of video and animation as well as text um, that require students to do a lot more in terms of constructing their responses, uh, writing essays, um, manipulating graphs, constructing different kinds of models through drag and drop kinds of functionality that's much more interactive, all of which requires more bandwidth, obviously. Um, and so while the consortia are really working to uh, develop the assessments, especially for the field test in the first operational year that will help meet schools where they are, there's obviously a lot of the, the demands for the infrastructure that we're looking at is coming from this increased richness. The other thing that I want to just mention about these shifts is really about the interoperability piece. And um, both of the consortia have committed to making assessments that are device agnostic, that will work across lots of different kinds of platforms and can evolve with our learning environments as they become increasingly wireless, increasingly mobile. Um, and so there's a lot of what we're doing in terms of the back end technology of these assessments that is hugely focused on interoperability, both of the technologies for the items and the um, data, but also for reporting um, and things like that. The other piece that helps drive demands for increased uh, complexity of the technology infrastructure and increased bandwidth demand has to do with the ability for the technology to um, embed uh, support for students with disabilities and a range of embedded accommodations and um, accessibility features for all students, um, including things like 
text-to-speech and onboard magnification, student-controlled um, highlighting and, and customized colors for students with certain visual disabilities. And part of what the consortia are working with on this aspect is um, capturing that as part of the student's enrollment data for the assessment or registration information for the assessment as a um, personal needs profile that will then ultimately invoke within the platform, the test delivery platform, these um, kinds of embedded supports and accommodations. And so, as you can imagine, many of those things also uh, require more connectivity and more uh, a richer, more robust environment, network environment to deliver those, those assessments. So as the consortia are helping prepare their, their schools and districts, um, common theme, which has been echoed throughout the presentation already today, is to not look at the technology genies for assessments in isolation. The, the assessment does not stand by itself. As we're out there helping our schools with their capacity planning and, and thinking through the, the needs, it is very much in the context of learning and assessment. It's very much about professional development and the, the administrative needs in the school and to be thinking out um, holistically, not just purchasing devices or looking at the, the bandwidth needs for the summative assessment a few weeks alone. So that's a big piece of how we're working with our state to, to help get them ready. Um, as we talk about those capacity needs, obviously one of the, the hot topics of discussion is around what the consortia are uh, looking for in terms of minimum device specifications and minimum bandwidth specifications based on the design of the assessments themselves um, and how they'll be administered. So what you're looking at here are the park specifications, although the smarter balance specifications are very similar. We deviate a little bit on some of these points. But um, as you'll see, sometimes we, we get a hit for, uh, take a hit for saying that we will still work with Windows XP or some of the other older operating systems. But um, as you'll see in some of the other trends that I'll share here in a moment, this is still the majority of the machines that are out there in our schools. And so we needed to build assessments that worked with those, but at the same time, the conversation is very much around helping schools think about their transition um, out of older operating systems and um, being able to evolve their capacity as the technology evolves. Of course, all of this information is available on the PARC website, so um, you can look up that detail then. Um, we have set definitions for minimums for memory and processor, um, also for screen size. This one becomes significant, obviously, when we think about the, um, the impact then on, on the devices themselves. So this means that desktops, laptops, tablets of a certain size are supported for the park assessment, um, but mobile phones, smaller tablets, um, are not. And if there are questions about that decision, I can talk more about that, but it has to do a lot with the, the screen real estate for students doing complex tasks um, and interactive, uh, more interactive kinds of assessment items. Um, for the park bandwidth, you'll see we have, as with other things, two different levels. So we have a, a bare minimum, which is based on if the assessment is cached and if the students are taking that assessment um, where, where the, especially the more media rich pieces have already been cached um, and are not trying to push that out all over the school all at once. So that's that very minimum of five kilobits per second per student is, is what we're looking at. Then this 100 kilobits per second per student uh, recommended is really based on that CETA recommendation, and Evan was referencing this earlier, of uh, thinking holistically about building out capacity across the instructional and assessment and professional development needs um, in a more rich, technology-rich learning environment. So to assist our schools and districts in this planning, um, Smarter Balanced, PARC, and CETA have joined together with, to 
put out some tools for our schools to use. Um, and this is the technology readiness tool. So each state has a set of accounts that they can set up for districts and at the school building level as well. Um, really, this is a tool for the states and districts themselves to look at their own readiness. Um, to do their own inventories about devices, to take their own um, data snapshots around network capacity. And the consortia used these data as they've come in um, to help drive our decisions around the minimum specifications like that Windows XP decision um, and also around assessment design. Uh, but really, you'll see, I, I was pleased that Evans presentation was so data rich because um, the trends I have to share are I, I don't have I'm not using a lot of the specific percentages or numbers um, because each state has used the tool in a different way. Um, and so some states have contributed data from the state agency where they are using existing survey data from within their state and so not all of the fields are completed. In other uh, states they've handed this down and made it require that every school building complete the survey tool. So because of the data collection being um, applied very unevenly across the different states because they're doing different things with it, um, I don't have a lot of specific numbers, but I am going to share with you some of these trends. Um, to help facilitate the use of this and facilitate that planning, we do have um, points of contact in every state that are the state readiness coordinators or state readiness coordination teams. And where this is working the best, these are teams that involve people um, from assessment as well as people from technology as well as people from curriculum instruction, combination of, of district leaders and state leaders. Um, just going to kind of skip over this. These are the various parameters that we're collecting through the technology readiness tool. A lot of it's um, you know, basics of the, the machines themselves as well as some of the network uh, levels and network utilization. And then a survey that has some questions about staff and personnel readiness. Um, each state has their own access point into the tool where they can manage their own data and run their own reports um, and down to the district and school building level for that as well. Um, what I want to share though is just from uh, a little more than a year, uh, we launched the tool in March of 2012. So um, since then, you know, these are the, the patterns that we see in terms of using this capacity, thinking about capacity and planning. Um, it's really how, how critical it is to have this not be a siloed effort where just the tech people are, are talking about the needs or just the assessment people are talking about the needs and, and where we see the, the most successful implementation of this and, and where the planning seems to be most rich is very much where there is that coordination and, and good communication about both expectations and data and then looking at the data and really making plans based on that. Um, and things like the, the speed test, the Education Superhighway speed test are increasingly factoring into this kind of local planning which is uh, an excellent trend um, and going to be critical because states are in very different places, schools are in very different places. A uh, quick overview here of some of the trends that we're seeing. Um, these are based on uh, 7.9 million devices that have been reported over uh, both consortia. Um, so that's representing the 72,000 schools and 14,000 districts. Of the devices that have been reported, good news is most of those machines are meeting or exceeding the consortium minimum. And other than operating system, um, many of them are also meeting that higher level of recommended specification. Uh, but the numbers of machines obviously are something that a lot of districts are still working to, to build toward. Um, this Windows XP issue obviously becomes significant. It is the majority of the devices that are still in use in the schools that are going to be used for assessment. And this um, operating system is being phased out by Microsoft. So we're, we're working with our schools and districts on planning for the future for that migration of the technology. No surprising, we're seeing growing use every snapshot that we take. There are more and more tablets that are being reported, uh, more and more uh, wireless connectivity as the primary source of connectivity for those devices. 
Um, and so far, this is interesting, we just started asking this question. Because we've asked the schools to report only on devices that are going to be used for assessment, right now, nearly all of those devices are being reported as owned by the school or owned by the district, not by the students themselves, although we anticipate that we're going to see that number growing. Um, in terms of the network, uh, we do see that there it's, it's all over the place, and it's very difficult, really, for us to um, get a, a big picture snapshot on this. It's so local. And just think back. I loved Evan's diagram. I am actually going to ask to borrow that, Evan, repurposing um, <laughs> your content there, um, of where we've got the connections coming through the district in some cases. Um, in other cases, the schools themselves are directly connected to the internet. And because this information is sometimes being reported by the local personnel in the schools, sometimes by the district, sometimes they're just reporting what their ISP provider is telling them their connectivity is. They're not actually uh, looking at utilization. These numbers are currently very difficult to report. And so um, right now, a lot of our schools aren't reporting them in the context of this survey. So again, some of that other work of actually going and doing speed tests and doing local um, inventories of, of the bandwidth configuration is, is very, very critical to, to moving forward here. Um, I'm conscientious of the time, so I just want to talk about one other tool that the that Park has released to help with that uh, very local network configuration issue, um, specifically related to then how are schools thinking about administering the assessments given their real student populations, given their real configuration. Are those computers in a computer lab or are they spread across the school two per classroom? Um, are they in the library or media center? Are they wired? Are they wireless? All of those pieces that um, are very local to understanding the capacity needs. So we have this capacity planning tool that brings together some of those specifics about the device and network configurations and really how they're being deployed in the school building um, and putting that together with what we know about the assessment design, how long the assessment window is likely to be for each of the parts of the assessment um, at different grade levels. And what this tool does, it has, uh, it requests some very, it's just an Excel spreadsheet based tool, but it um, requests just basic information about student populations for each grade, the number of devices, um, some of that basic network information. It also has a section that uh, helps um, then think through how the other uses of the internet that are simultaneously taking place uh, during assessment will impact what's really available for assessment. And um, we do recommend that they do real speed tests and run it multiple times at multiple times of the day under conditions under which assessment is likely to be occurring as well um, to help refine those numbers and get those better estimates. So well, the output of this tool then, and this is my last slide, I believe, is um, then to help schools think through different models that have different student to device ratios, different bandwidth levels um, based on, um, for example, if you uh, want to have a, a one week window for the math uh, performance based evaluation uh, assessment that you, how many simultaneous test takers would you need to have given your actual population and the actual number of devices and the actual bandwidth that you have available? Um, and then the inverse set of models, knowing the number of devices you have and um, the number of students, how many days would you need based on that to, to get all your students through the assessments? Um, for each component, each, each set of sessions for math and ELA at different times of the year. So these are tools that are out there to assist um, helping to really think about that, that capacity need. And so I'm going to pause there. Thanks, Susan. That was a fantastic presentation. And I know we're a few minutes over. Um, and so I think what you highlighted also really um, 
pushes us to think about Evan, what Evan's doing and your tools to push schools, uh, districts, and states to do broadband speed tests so it can get better data uh, to continue to make the case. For, for those that can stay on, I have two questions in the hopper. For those of you that need to jump off, we know that we've gone over the time. But Susan, are you okay with um, answering two quick questions? Great. Absolutely. So Happy Chris to. Parker is asking for online schools specifically, how will students be required to meet park technology requirements using their home PCs, and, and this has to deal with remote testing, and, and I think it has to do with technology specifications, but also the windows and the proctors. Right, so um, the, in terms of the devices, the device need is the same. Um, the, the device is being used, whether it's the student's home computer or um, a device that the student is allowing, or that the school is allowing them to use to participate in online school. Um, those minimum requirements for the machines themselves and the, the level of connectivity still apply. Uh, for Park, where we don't have um, any required like custom browser download or any other kinds of plugins that are required just for the assessment. Um, so you know, standard browser and and those. But newer versions of those browsers and, and that information will be released. So that those things still apply. Um, the security pieces are obviously more about the policy for administration. Um, the the assessment itself will lock down um, the device, and that's one of the requirements is that the for the devices themselves is that they can be locked down which is why there are some devices that are popular for instruction that we have not been able to allow for use of the assessment because there's no way um, to say, for example, turn off the camera or um, allow the application that is the assessment to uh, disable Bluetooth unless there's already been an approved sync to a keyboard or something like that. So um, the the administration policy is something we do not yet have ready for review. We're working with our states. Different states have different approaches to that. And as you can imagine with these consortia, we have to have um, common, common policy around a lot of this. But at the same time, we're trying to accommodate as much local existing policy as, as possible. Um, so we're working through that right now is the short answer in terms of the the actual administration and how the security will work for that. With sure, and security. that may be a topic that we do a follow-up webinar because I think there are going to be a lot of that, getting into the administration. This, this webinar today has really been focused on E-Rate 2.0 and the drivers and the capacity needs from the perspective of both digital learning and innovation as well as the needs of the 2014 online assessments. And I just want to thank, uh, thank all of the speakers today, uh, Susan and Evan and Jennifer, for uh, fantastic presentations and all of the participants. Uh, we covered a lot of ground. And again, this is the second of three webinar series for E-Rate 2.0. If you have any follow-up questions about the webinar, feel free to reach out to Maria Worthen at iNACL. She's our Vice President for Federal and State Policy. And we have archived the webinar. Um, feel free to share the link with others. Thanks to everyone, and hope you have a great rest of the day. <laughs>